Hello everyone, this is Max Duryagin and with me my two guests Daniel Landes and Miroslav Poshta who will try to help me shed light on the use of machine translation in the field of ABT, audiovisual translation. Uh, so first let me introduce them. I actually have prepared a little bit of text here and I will now read it. Daniel Landes is one of ABT's leading experts on machine translation. He has a BA in Anglistics and Scandinavian Studies and specializes in video game localization. Throughout his career, he has collaborated on multiple AAA titles and from 2015 to 2018, he was at the helm of the localization efforts of a video game project as German translator and editor. Daniel has a special interest in the sustainability of the localization industry. My sec second guest, Miroslav Poshta, is also part of ABT's Machine Translation Working Group. He has a master's degree in translation studies and economics and is a Czech translator, subtitler and QCR. Miroslav is the author of the first two Czech language books in, on subtitling and another book on language technologies for translators. He has taught audiovisual translation at Charles University and the University of Ostrava and given lectures elsewhere in Czechia and Slovakia. At the Czech Union of Interpreters and Translators, he is responsible for ABT issues. So, to begin, could you guys please give our viewers a very brief over overview of the machine translation technology um, in our field? Um, Daniel, let's start with you. Yes, Max, thank you. So to start us off, I want to give us a short introduction in the different types of machine translation that, that are out there right now. And I want to start with rule-based machine translation, where you basically teach the artificial intelligence a set of grammar rules. This approach is not that widely used anymore because it's quite limited and not very flexible. So if grammar changes, for example, you have to go back and teach the artificial intelligence uh, the changes, of course. What is uh, being used more widely these days is statistical machine translation. Um, and in this model, basically, the artificial intelligence uh, looks at a lot of bilingual documents and finds out about the relationship between word pairs. So based on the probability of, of the sequence of words in a given context, the machine is going to predict uh, a translation or a, a phrase and a sentence and how it's going to be translated. And all the rage right now is the neural machine translation, which is basically the next step in statistical machine translation, where you combine the statistical approach with uh, deep learning and uh, neural networks. However, um, this, this new uh, miracle uh, technology is, is a bit of a black box. Um, and a black box in this uh, context means that you have the input and the output but you don't really know what's going on in between. So even the people who came up with, with this technology are unsure how the machine reaches uh, the, the translation uh, specifically. So it's kind of unpredictable, uh, so to speak. Now, um, we need to know that machine translation engines need to be trained. And uh, they are being trained by using already existing human translations. And um, in the traditional TEP, translation, editing, and proofreading uh, workflow, machine translation obviously takes over the translation uh, part. And then the human is going to take over the rule of the post editor. And that's how we come to the name that's uh, being used and thrown around uh, a lot these days. MTPE for machine translation post editing. Now, another thing that I would like to touch upon uh, in this context is uh, computer assisted translation or CAT tools. Uh, they differ from machine translation. The big names in this, uh, in this industry are MemoQ and uh, Trados by SDL. And uh, here uh, we are talking about a special software uh, a translation environment where, as you can see here on the screenshot, you have two columns. On the left side is the source text. On the right side is the translation. You have uh, a preview pane down here below where you can see the formatting of the original document that you in imported in the software. 
And the specialty uh, of these uh, computer assisted translation softwares is that uh, they work with integrated so called translation memories, where all the translations made in a given project are stored and saved and can be leveraged again later, as well as uh, glossaries or term bases uh, that can help you out with terminology. So um, this can save time or can, can help you out because uh, here to the right, you can see the results pane where uh, based on the match rate of any given segment, uh, the computer is proposing or suggesting you already translated sentences that you can use. So for example, if you translated before the sentence, I would like to buy a house, and now you're translating the sentence, I would like to buy a dog, uh, the match rate of the segment is going to be pretty high. So you can use the previous installation and just swap out the words house and dog. In addition, if uh, in your glossary or in your term base, you have entered translations for house and dog, uh, the software can even suggest this change yourself. Or you just uh, can uh, conduct it with a simple click on, on, the, on the term. Yeah, so I think this, those are the most uh, relevant um, technological features uh, for our discussion today. And um, giving back to you, Max. All right. Um, well, okay, I see. And, but is there any difference between using these different kinds of machine translation for ABT and for other translation fields? Or is it all the same? Miroslav, what do you think? Well, yes, Max. Uh, actually, I have uh, hands-on experience with different machine translation engines and in different domains of translation. Uh, on the one hand, uh, it's been legal translation. Namely, I've worked with machine translation engines um, for uh, EU legislation. And then I've seen uh, machine translation uh, output uh, for subtitles for film series and also documentaries. I've also experimented with uh, machine translation when translating a play. So I've been able to see the uh, the difference uh, between uh, these different domains uh, in the output and uh, the difference between statistical and neural machine translation. Now, for legal translation, in my experience, uh, it clearly helps. Although, of course, there's still a number of pitfalls, which we'll certainly discuss later. And um, even in a legal translation, uh, machine translation uh, engines cannot replace uh, the human translator. Um, uh, you have to be very accurate in the citations um, and so on and so forth. But anyway, the, the language in legal translation or in technical translation is very repetitive. Uh, you have to use uh, a lot of set phrases that have to be translated in a specific way. So. Um, um, the uh, machine translation engines can be of uh, help. Uh, also, there's very little idiomaticity. Uh, meanings are expressed very explicitly and clearly. On the contrary, uh, in subtitling or in audiovisual translation in general, um, machine translation is not by far as helpful in my uh, experience. It's especially because the language isn't as repetitive as in legal translation, for example. It calls for very creative solutions. And there are also what I would call uh, more layers of context. There's the image, the action, the sound. Um, we all know that um, irony, for example, in the tone uh, of the speaker can change the meaning completely. Uh, word stress is another uh, thing that can completely change the meaning of the, s of the whole sentence. And it has to be many, uh, many times it has to be translated in very different ways, depending on the word stress in the sentence. There are gestures and uh, the body language which also modify um, or add to the, to the meaning. So very often in audiovisual translation, the same simple sentence can have very different meanings depending on the situation, uh, including simple things such as, hey, or come on. So the human translator has to supply 
um, a lot of relevant information. Let me give you an example. Let's take the sentence, did you go to the center yesterday, meaning going to the city center. When I work into Czech, I have to ask several questions. I have to ask who is being spoken to. Uh, in other words, I have to see who the, uh, who the person speaking is looking at. Is uh, it one person or several people? Is it a man or a woman? What's the relationship between the speaker and the other person? Uh, in other words, what's uh, the level, what should be the level of politeness? And uh, in some languages, we also have to ask, um, did the person walk to the center or did he or she use a vehicle? Um, also, the stress in the sentence plays a role. Now, I've written down all the uh, different possibilities uh, uh, when working from English into Czech, when trans translating this sentence, and I've come up with 12 different possibilities, and I only took into account the masculine and feminine. I didn't take into account the neuter. S um, so I have to make a decision on all these questions uh, well, uh, the machine translation, when it has the task of translating this same sentence, only uses whatever seems to be most statistically relevant. It will not be able to ask these questions. So, if you uh, if you look at the uh, at the screenshot at the uh, uh, at the slide uh, that I've prepared, uh, first you can see that there are those twelve possibilities. And then in the next one, I've shown uh, outputs from uh, two major uh, machine translation engines. One of them is Google Translate. Uh, it, of course, it only ch could choose one of them. It shows uh, the one uh, where the person is going on foot. Uh, it's several people, it's men, and uh, it's uh, both uh, formal and informal. Uh, E-translation, the, uh, the EU translation, uh, machine translation engine, on the other hand, shows a different uh, approach. Uh, uh, it uh, translated the sentence as Byl si včera v centru, which means uh, were you in the center yesterday? It completely dropped the verb to go and changed it to, to be. So uh, you can see that um, um, machine uh, translation uh, engines cannot ask the same questions that we do. Now, when I used machine translation for the play, it was a kind of experiment. And I have to say that uh, machine translation as such was not helpful at all. But um, um, the CAT tool, which I used for that, was pretty useful. And uh, some um, um, uh, and uh, one uh, particular feature, the auto suggest or the the auto complete uh, function functionality, was uh, very helpful uh, as well. Mm. And of course, in audiovisual translation, there are additional constraints on our uh, choices, right? Oh yes, exactly. That's uh, thank you for for reminding me. Um, yes, there are uh, a lot of additional constraints, uh, especially um, uh, we have to respect the maximum reading speed. In other words, the subtitles cannot be too fast because uh, if they are too fast, if there are too many characters per second, uh, the viewers uh, wouldn't be able to read the subtitles or enjoy the, the film. So we have to respect a kind of speed limit. Um, also, we have to respect short or scene changes, um, the maximum number of characters per, per line or per subtitle and um, uh, therefore the wording has to be condensed we have to use very creative tricks to uh, communicate all the information with uh, as few characters as possible and uh, sometimes uh, the least relevant information has to be dropped altogether but it has to be a well-informed decision um, and I don't think that a machine can decide what information is the least relevant. In dubbing on the other hand or in addition, uh, the text has to be lip-synced uh, 
and uh, in a uh, voiceover the script uh, has to be easy to pronounce as well so in all types of audio visual translation the lines have to sound natural so uh, in my opinion the result is that uh, machine translation is much less useful for audio vis visual translators uh, well or at least for films and series because uh, we should uh, mention that audio visual translation also includes other types of content such as lectures training videos and so on and so forth so um if uh, we go back to our uh, post-editing machine translation, um, uh, my experience is that uh, uh, to work with machine translated output in audiovisual translation is much more laborious and time consuming because very often you have to improve the word choices, the, the word endings uh, have to be, mo be modified. You have to change the word order. Um, very often um, literal equivalents have to be replaced by uh, or with more natural and idiomatic language. So very often it's better to delete the machine translation uh, the machine translated suggestion and do it simply the old way um, also uh, subtitling software usually doesn't offer uh, those helpful uh, cat tool features that uh, we've mentioned uh, which are so common in other fields of translation and uh, these are features such as autocomplete or concordancing um, uh, and finally, let me also share with you um, my experience as a reviser or as a QCA, as it's called th these days. Uh, my experience is that some subtitlers rely on machine translation simply too much. They keep literal equivalents uh, offered by the machine translation engine that they would probably never use without machine translation. I've seen very good translators submitting very poor work when they started using mach machine translation. And it's, in my opinion, it's unfair to uh, the QCA because then he or she has to do the rewriting, although it should really be uh, the job of the translator. Uh, and uh, after all, the uh, QCA is not paid for uh, this kind of creative work for totally rewriting uh, the machine translated output. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've also done QC of these post-edited subtitles and noticed things quite similar to what you've just said. Um, but regardless, even though MT is less useful in our field, in our profession, I imagine it still offers at least some advantages, um, doesn't it? Um, Daniel, what's your take? Um, yeah, of course, there are some advantages that you can get out of machine translation. For example, um, if you're stuck on a particular sentence, phrase or expression, you can always use the machine translation as inspiration uh, that you can polish or you can work off of. I've done that a couple of times in the past and uh, it saves you time uh, to get over this initial bump. Uh, then, of course, uh, machine translation is very good at reproducing already existing translations. So if you want to, if you're working on cooking recipes or instruction manuals uh, where you want to have um, as little variety as possible and where coherence is key, um, machine translation is really good for that. And machine translation also works well in cases where the quality needs to be only good enough. I'm thinking here, uh, for example, about uh, customer support, uh, where you have two people that don't speak a common language and need to help each other out, out or, or one person has a problem and the other person needs to, to help you out and needs to get a point across without it being super polished. So I think that would be a scenario where uh, machine translation is um, quite feasible. Yeah, I totally agree. If, uh, if I can interrupt here, Daniel, um, sure. you mentioned uh, good enough quality. And I think that's very important here because I don't think that 
good enough quality is the way uh, the way to go in audiovisual translation because you see if the filmmakers the film crew have invested a lot of talent time and money to make the perfect film or series then why should their effort be undermined in the home stretch by poor subtitles or dubbing uh, only because of machine translation yeah and also i think more often than not filmmakers are not made aware of the fact that their stuff is machine translated um, i think if they were they wouldn't be happy about that for sure i mean imagine um, like quentin tarantino s told that his last and tenth film is going to be machine translated he probably would be furious and so would be other content creators if if only they were told but i think they uh, aren't and this lack of transparency is quite an issue yeah yeah i totally agree and actually to to add a another potential advantage to uh, to um keep it uh, a little bit positive machine translation can save you some typing not uh, much typing but some typing in some cases where um uh there's something repetitive because there are some repetitive sentences or expressions such as nice to meet you congratulations or way to go uh, although of course they can also be uh, translated in different ways in uh, in different situations some uh, sometimes in in some languages but uh, actually as uh, translators um we don't think about these sentences very much. Uh, the, we almost use our autopilot to translate these set phrases. And also, most of us translators are pretty fast typers. Many of us uh, of us can uh, touch type. So um, machine translation is not so much help here either. And finally, the uh, the, the last uh, uh, the last advantage I can think of is that uh, it can uh, give you a good laugh. Um, uh, uh, you can you can share uh, those uh, outputs, uh, the the funny outputs, uh, with uh, your uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, that's all the advantages I can think of. Um, um, what 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 do you think, Daniel? <laughs> Um, yeah, I think the last one is a good point. I've I've seen many a uh, shared uh, machine translation in a in a work chat, and we've gotten quite a good laugh out of those. <laughs> yeah, um, moving on to disadvantages. Uh, so, uh, what what we've already come across before as well is um, the context that the machine can understand only in a very uh, limited fashion. So. Uh, Lucia Spezia from the University of Sheffield, for example, uh, said in a talk from the Goethe Institute in London that machine translation, even in the near future, will only be able to understand maximal uh, a couple of pages in a book, but it will never be able to understand an entire book due to the underlying technical framework. And this mm -hmm. is not going to change mm -hmm. anytime soon. Yeah, um, actually, um, in my experience, um, empty engines, when it comes to <clears throat> AVT, don't really understand what's going on in the film or episode of a series. Um, so they can often give you a suggestion that works linguistically, but doesn't make logical sense in the context of the plot or a scene or maybe action on screen, stuff like that. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And they're also prone to like randomly omitting words when they translate and they struggle with proper names. And I think Mirek, you had a pretty good example on that. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, for example, I've seen um, the the name of the company Apple Computer uh, Computer uh, translated um, into Czech literally as Yablechny um, Pochitač, or um, which sounds like a computer made of uh, made of apples. So um, it's. Uh, uh, it's quite common that uh, the machine translation engine translate uh, translates things that should not be translated. And uh, with uh, neural machine translation, you can see what you uh, did not see previously with uh, with st statistical machine translation. And it is 
that the the engine invents neologisms uh, i can give you an example for example the the name of the of the uh, composer and uh, violinist uh, paganini has been uh, translated or ca can be translated by a neural machine translation engine uh, into czech as uh, uh, pohanini uh, simply it takes uh, a part of the of the word uh, pagan uh, translates it literally from english into czech and adds the the rest of the of the word from the original so i've seen Paganini becoming uh, Pohanini in, in Czech. Um, and also, um, it uh, can randomly omit and add words, which is very tricky because you have to be very careful. It's like, uh, it's like revising uh, a very uh, poor translator's, uh, human uh, translator's output. And uh, uh, there's another problem when uh, machine translation engines are used to translate uh, between two languages through a third language, especially uh, or mostly it's English. So I've seen, for example, the Czech word uh, cizinets, which means foreigner, translated into Russian as, um, and now sorry, Max, uh, uh, for my pronunciation, as inaplanetianian, which means extraterrestrial. So uh, it's clear it went through English, through the English word alien, and uh, the foreigner became an extraterrestrial. So uh, it can be very tricky. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thanks for those uh, really good examples. Um, Another thing is that uh, we've learned before that machine translation is very good at reproducing uh, translations that have been done before. As a consequence, machine translation really struggles when it has to come up with new solutions and being creative. So for example, um, if you have to, to write dialogue where you can't translate literally but have to transcreate, humans will always produce a more natural sounding output uh, than a machine. Uh, the next uh, thing that I would like to mention is uh, the quality that can be quite uh, inconsistent. Uh, the quality of the output uh, from the machine depends on a lot of different factors. So for example, we have uh, the curation and the quality of the corpora. Uh, and here I would just like to mention the, the difference between Deep, DeepL and Google uh, Translate, where DeepL is taking uh, a more fine-tuned approach and is uh, taking better care of the corpora they use as backend, whereas Google Translate uh, uh, goes into, into the mass and has a lot of uh, text to work with, but it's not as fine-tuned. Uh, then as Mirek mentioned before, we have the problem of English as a pivot language. So the quality between language pairs uh, can also vary uh, greatly uh, depending on if you have bilingual corpora available for the specific language pair. Then we have the type of text. Do you translate a creative text or instructive text? The machine is gonna be able to do the latter and it was gonna struggle with the first one. And the style of the source text is also gonna be uh, influential because if you have long uh, winded sentences uh, versus short and concise writing, uh, the machine is gonna have an easier time translate the short sentence, obviously. It also depends on, on if this, the source text was written with machine translation in mind. So if the human who, who wrote the original text already took into consideration that they should make uh, their sentence structure as easy as possible, um, use no colloquialism and, and such things. And then the last uh, factor in the quality department is the preparation of the source text. Has it been properly segmented? Uh, is it Has it been made so that the machine can easily grasp and understand the units of meaning. The next thing that we've already briefly touched upon earlier is the training aspects. So you have to understand that there's no machine translation engine that's good for everything just out of the gate. You have to tra uh, train your engines for the specific field that you want to use them in. So there's always uh, an upfront investment required for each new project that you're gonna tackle. And one thing that, that is uh, most important for us translators is the so-called translator's bias. So what do we mean by that? This means that a translator 
is already influenced when they see uh, the output from the machine translation and uh, will lose uh, a portion of their own creative voice when they simply post edit a machine translation. Dorothy Kenny and Marion Winters from Dublin City University have, uh, have done an experiment on this. Um, and they found out that the creative voice of a translator will be diminished by around 33%. Uh, in the same vein, we have the problem that the homogeneity of machine translation engines uh, that use so-called feedback loops where the output gets corrected and then fed back into the machine translation can eventually lead to reduced richness and diversity of language uh, because basically it's going to be all the same. Hmm. Yeah, this uh, potential erosion of language is certainly a danger in the long term. It's one possible consequence of using MT in our profession. Can you think of any other such consequences, um, Daniel? Uh, yeah, most definitely. There, there are a couple of them. Um, I'm going to divide them into three categories, actually. And I want to start with the economic aspect. So as uh, I think all of us are aware of is that the, the current situation of translators is already pretty precarious since our rates have stagnated in the past 20 years and there hasn't been uh, adjustment for inflation, for example. Uh, now that the discourse around MTPE suggests that the machine is doing the actual work and the heavy lifting, um, we are afraid that uh, rates are going to be reduced even further be because obviously uh, we don't do as much work anymore. However, Felix do Carmo from the University of Surrey argues uh, that the opposite uh, is the case. He says that you actually need highly skilled and trained linguists for uh, post-editing a machine translation. And if the pay is not adequate, the industry will definitely suffer from brain drain. Mm, yeah, yeah, I actually think that it already is happening and it actually has been happening for quite a while. Um, um, people just are leaving our profession because of, as you've said, the stagnated rates and then um, deteriorating working conditions. And um, as I've seen a lot of this firsthand as secretary of the British Subtitlers Association, that uh, people have told me that they have to work full time and even then they don't make the minimum monthly salary in their country so they cannot sustain their livelihood or that or that of their um, family uh, it, and they say that apparently AVT is the at least one of the least com the least well-paid uh, types of translation so what they do is either they they change the, the type of translation they provide or they change professions altogether they can become a teacher or or they can go in-house rather than be a freelancer or um, something like that. And I think in that respect, MT poses a problem because many people have told me that they don't see themselves becoming post editors. That's not what they signed up for. That's not what they want to do. They do not want to be fixing what a machine wrote. They want to be translating themselves. They want to be creative. They want to be authors. And that's where they find joy, not in, in post-editing. Um, so yeah, this is also an issue, I think. Yeah, most definitely. And thank you for those first-hand um, experiences, uh, which totally match uh, everything that I've heard or, or lived through in, in the industry so far. But but back to, to consequences. Since the, the quality of the MT output uh, varies so much, um, translators technically would have to charge uh, by the hour because they don't know how much time they're going to need uh, to to fix the, the machine translation output. However, for the big players, the companies in this industry, this is not very attractive because it's easier to budget with fixed units like words or minutes. Then if we look at quality, uh, uh, the instructions that go around these days are uh, leave as much of the machine translation output as possible. And uh, this, uh, this uh, leads to two problems. Uh, in, in the long run, quality will suffer uh, because we are adapting to the machine instead of the machine to us. And also as a translator, you spend a lot of time deciding whether you should change something or whether it's an acceptable translation. 
Over time, uh, we also see the danger that post editors could become blind to machine uh, language, and again, the overall uh, quality will suffer. And another thing that we've already briefly touched on uh, earlier is that neural machine translation can be quite unpredictable. So even if the output can sound quite natural and fluent, mistranslations are very difficult to spot and you need to be working uh, highly focused 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. Which leads us directly into the scalability argument. Uh, let's face it, humans are always going to be the bottleneck since they have to be so highly focused and working all the time when they post edit machine translation. So um, there's a limit to how much you can scale. And since this work is going to uh, be less paid, but more uh, intensive in terms of concentration work, uh, burnout is a very possible danger that can occur here. Again, here, machine translation can affect the way we translate as humans uh, in the long run, because we are going to adapt to the machine instead of the other way around. And if the job is, like you said before, Max, uh, is not attractive anymore, um, even if uh, the people who are post-edit are a bit more efficient, uh, potentially, if people are leaving the industry, you won't have enough people to work with. So your scalability is also going down the drain. And uh, another argument that Mirek uh, mentioned uh, earlier as well is that the time that you save during the translation step is eventually going to come back to you during the quality control. So you haven't really saved time. You've just shifted the time necessary into the lower paying uh, step of the workflow, which also cannot be uh, the right way to go. And uh, there is also, I think, this other consequence that's related to the translator's status changing from author to post-editor. And it's quite important because in many European countries, translators are considered authors. So their translations are their intellectual properties. And then companies can ask them for permission to use those intellectual properties and pay them royalties. This is called economic rights. There are also moral rights, among which is the right to be credited. But uh, these royalties for many people in Europe is a huge part of their income, in some cases up to 50%. And uh, if the policymakers don't do it right, and this status changes to post-editor, and they lose their auth author's rights, they lose all that money. Imagine, imagine losing half of your income over such a technicality. Um, I mean, you won't be able to support yourself or, or your family anymore. So that's also one um, problematic consequence, I think. Um, yeah, and uh, it seems to me that the disadvantages uh, far outweigh the advantages here. Um, so does this mean that we should just be completely against MT in AVT? Or is there a way to maybe fix this imbalance and make MT um, beneficial and sustainable to all? Or maybe are there any alternatives to it? Um, Mira? Yes, Max, definitely. I think there are lots of other alternatives or options uh, and tools and uh, ways uh, how to how to help um, uh, translators and uh, subtitlers. Let me cover the technical aspects. Um, We've seen that the the value added by machine translation is uh, quite questionable in audiovisual translation, uh, and I feel that developers, in spite of that, don't pay enough attention to other technologies and practices that might be uh, much more beneficial and less costly. We've already mentioned. Uh, cat features that are very common in other types of translation but uh, very rarely implemented in subtitling software especially concordancing um, which is searching uh, translation memories um, and uh, it is something that could really help much more than one machine translated uh, sentence when you have uh, uh, access to uh, to lots uh, of examples of the same uh, of the same um, uh, sentence or uh, sen same expression being translated into the other language um, 
Concordancing can also be of great help uh, when it comes to consistency. Uh, for example, when several people are working on the same program, on the same series, for example. Um, we've also mentioned uh, term base uh, or glossary lookup, uh, which can be uh, quite helpful, um, although not so much in audiovisual translation, but it can be helpful for documentaries, for example. And then uh, there's uh, my favorite feature, which is autocomplete. Um, uh, you have seen uh, you've seen a screenshot of uh, a cat tool now uh, I'd like to show you uh, um, um, close-up of uh, the autocomplete function uh, here um, it's uh, an example of a text uh, being translated from English into Czech and uh, um, um, as soon as uh, you press the first uh, uh, key with the first letter of the um, word you uh, are going to write, uh, you get a suggestion from uh, from the uh, auto auto complete uh, feature. So it could be uh, very helpful in uh, audiovisual translation uh, as well. Now. Um, if we talked uh, about machine translation as a source of inspiration, then um, uh, these uh, tools, uh, concordancing and autocomplete, uh, can really be uh, much more beneficial than machine translation. Uh, but there are also other CAT features that uh, would be very helpful, such as filtering. Um, after all, um, when I mentioned concordancing, uh, I'd like to say that it's a feature known from, from language corpora, which is also a tool which can be very helpful. And uh, unfortunately, uh, um, there are not too many uh, um, corpora of uh, uh, subtitles, uh, with the exception of uh, fan subs, of course. Uh, there are uh, large corpora uh, with uh, fan subs. Now, another tool I can think of is uh, dictation software, which is uh, often chosen by translators as an alternative to machine translation to improve their performance and also perhaps to prevent uh, repetitive strain injury but uh, very often uh, dictation applications don't support subtitling uh, software or uh, vice versa uh, so uh, if you try to use uh, dictation software in subtitling uh, what you uh, often encounter is problems with uh, misplaced uh, spaces, hyphens, wrong capitalization, and uh, uh, dictation software uh, also can have problems with uh, colloquial, voc uh, colloquial vocabulary and morphology, because after all, dictation software is especially developed with professions like lawyers and doctors in mind. and. Uh, after and that's why some dictation applications even change colloquial expressions to standard uh, standard expressions which is something you don't want but again um all these tools should be optional um it sh they it should be like a buffet ready for the feast uh, after all uh, we as translators uh, uh can use uh, dictionaries, but it's also an optional tool. Nobody forces you to uh, use uh, your dictionary. But, you know, I often feel that uh, quality and performance could be improved by good old human collaboration uh, with good cooperation between the subtitler and the QCer with constructive feedback. Uh, very often we see that um, uh, there's very little feedback from the uh, from the client to the uh, to the subtit uh, subtitler. Um, another thing uh, I can think of is uh, uh, good annotations on difficult expressions by script authors or by native speakers, because. Uh, uh, 
an annotation or an explanation of a very obscure slang term can save us translators and subtitlers much more time than uh, machine translation. Uh, also, uh, since uh, our audiovisual content is often translated into multiple languages at the same time, uh, I feel that uh, uh, we could, uh, if we could co collaborate, uh, those of us uh, who are translating the same thing into several languages at the same time, I think uh, we could uh, also um, help each other and uh, improve the uh, the quality and the performance. And for all of this, uh, of course, you also need some appropriate tools, appropriate technologies. And uh, I feel that all of this can improve the sustainability in our uh, profession. But back to machine translation. When machine translated uh, suggestions are offered, um, uh, I feel that it should be uh, they should be easy to delete or hide um, because uh, it should be up to each and every subtitler uh, whether or not uh, he or she wants to use uh, machine translation uh, suggestions or not. And uh, ideally, they should only be displayed on demand. In other words, they, uh, machine translation suggestions should not come pre-filled in the boxes. Well, so that's the, that's the technical side. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mirek. Um, I'm going to dive into the professional aspects now uh, for our vision for machine translation done right. The first point that I uh, just want to touch upon again that Mirek already explained in more detail is that machine translation should be an optional tool and the individual translator should be able to decide whether they want to use it or not. Then the next point is fair pay. We think that the use of machine translation should not affect the current rates of the market. Potential efficiency gain should go to the translators 100% um, as a compensation for the missing inflation adjustment for the last 20 years. Then uh, again, the sustainability that Mirek already briefly mentioned before. Uh, we, I, I want to cite uh, Joss Morkins from Dublin City University here. Uh, and she suggests a so-called triple bottom line approach where sustainability is key and the needs of all the parties involved are met. So um, this, of course, uh, goes back to paying the translator adequately, but also um, creating an environment that is um, comfortable to work in for everybody involved. Now, what can we as translators do? We should try to get involved in the development process of the tools that we are going to use and give uh, feedback uh, regarding our needs. We should obviously get involved in the negotiation of payment models. So uh, we, we need to say uh, what we expect, what we need uh, in terms of, of monetary value. We should um, make a case for uh, the right to keep our own translations locally. Since we produce them and we are the authors, we should have the right to refer back to them for future projects. Um, and we ourselves uh, should think about what a sustainable rate would be. And we should also adhere to the rates that we uh, establish together. If we try to undercut ourselves, uh, we're just going to suffer in the long term and going to drop out of this industry. And uh, in a similar vein, we definitely have to offer guidance to newcomers in the industry in order to avoid exploitation uh, and guarantee a certain level of quality. Yeah, those are some great ideas and I completely agree. Um, that's a good vision for the for MT done right in our profession. Um, but yeah, I actually don't have any more questions. So I think this was a great interview. I learned a lot. And uh, thank you, gentlemen, for joining me today. And have a nice day. Bye. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.